So good morning, everybody. We are uh, resuming our, our series of uh, astrogeo seminar, and uh, for the first uh, for the first session in this uh, round, I'm very pleased to host uh, Linda Inoff from George Mason University in Virginia. Uh, Linda, I met Linda more than 30 years ago. And uh, she was already very enthusiastic about cyclostratigraphy. And, uh, uh, and I think that uh, for 30 years, she has been uh, enthusiastic about cyclostratigraphy and teaching about it, um, having collaboration everywhere with many people on uh, cyclostratigraphy, and in particular with my colleague in Paris, and also now a lot of collaboration in China, and she's uh, interacting with uh, many people in China to get the best record and uh, try to get something out of that. So, and I ask uh, Linda to speak about uh, all the, um, the present uh, record about that gives some information about the Earth's moon evolution. So this is what she will uh, speak of now. She will speak of the status of geological evidence for reconstructing Earth's moon dynamical parameters. So Linda, we are very pleased to hear you and it's all yours now. Okay, thank you very much, Jacques. Uh, I'm going to just jump right in. So, uh, well, first, let me just say that uh, these are representative uh, cyclostratigraphic sequences here on the left. Uh, the Pamplona marls are Cenozoic in age, and then the Joffrey member that's next to it is uh, Paleoproterozoic in age. So uh, very different uh, types of sediments, and both have been shown to carry astronomical signals. And over here on the right are three representatives of, uh, of, of uh, materials that have recorded the Earth's tide. So this is a tidalite. It's a sandstone in uh, South Australia. Uh, this here is a, a rudest bivalve, it's amazing, from Oman. And down here is a very common a quahog, uh, Mercenaria mercenaria, which has been studied uh, extensively for how it builds its shell. And it also, they, these, both of these carry uh, tidal signatures as well. And this is known as a tidalite. So I just wanted to say that there are uh, well-known uh, materials in geology that carry information about Earth Moon dynamical parameters. So, to summarize what I just said, uh, we have three geological media that provide quantitative data on Earth Moon, uh, on the Earth Moon evolution. And uh, the oldest of the, well, the oldest or, or the first set of media that came to light were in the fossils and in invertebrate fossils, marine fossils, which have subdiurnal, diurnal scale, tidal and seasonal growth increments. And they give us information about the Earth's spin rate and thereby the Earth moon distance, uh, the lunar orbital period and lunar months per year, especially if they record the tides and the fortnightly tides. But they are limited to a range of only the most recent half a billion years. And of course the earth is 4.5 billion years old. And so uh, we have to turn to other uh, media to uh, fill in the, uh, the blanks. And so tidalites uh, then came on onto the scene uh, with the recognition of these laminated sediments with, with beautiful irregular patterns indicating tidal response to tidal cycles and uh, seasonal uh, seasonal cycles. And they too will give us information about spin rate and earth moon distance, lunar, lunar, uh, lunar orbital period, lunar months per year. And in addition, because some of them actually last for many decades uh, occasionally, I know of two tidalite sequences that last for more than uh, more than 30 years. Uh, they gave us information about the nodal, the lunar nodal cycle. And 
theoretically, we could, uh, if we could find them throughout the geologic record, you know, the earliest sedimentary deposits uh, start at about four billion years ago. So we can uh, greatly extend our knowledge of, of earth moon parameters. But then most recently, cyclostratigraphy came on the scene uh, and has changed everything with its, uh, its uh, very refined record of orbital eccentricity, obliquity, and precession index cycles from which you can estimate the Earth precession rate. And from that, the spin rate and Earth-Moon distance. And in addition to that, uh, we now have methods to uh, estimate the solar system secular frequencies for the same times uh, that are consistent with the precession rate that's esti estimated. So that is a very important uh, development and plus the fact that cyclostratigraphy also occurs throughout geologic time and is more ubiquitous than either the fossils or tidalites. And so uh, we look forward to uh, you know, the next 20 years of refining and filling in our knowledge for Earth-Moon evolution from cyclostratigraphy. But fossils and tidalites also give us very important uh, 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 opportunities to confirm what we find from cyclostratigraphy, because since they give they give us using completely different uh, responses, we should arrive at the same answer for uh, for Earth spin rate as we do from cyclostratigraphy and the precession rate from which we get uh, spin rate. And if we don't, then we have to find out what uh, what we're doing wrong or what uh, or what that means. So there are several leading invertebrate fossil groups. Invertebrates you know, are the ones that don't have uh, vertebrae. And uh, the three leading groups uh, are the corals and the bivalves and the brachiopods. So in particular, uh, it was discovered that the solitary corals that existed uh, prior to 250 million years ago uh, showed the best signatures, and I'll show you some later. Bivalves, uh, and, and uh, these particular forms actually went extinct at the end of the Permian period, so they're an extinct form. So uh, there are problems with that because we don't have any uh, present day analogs to be able to understand how they built their shells. So we also have bivalves, and uh, these are these are two different bivalves that have been used to analyze the tides. Uh, bivalves have been around since you know, the early Cambrian, and, and there's still some that uh, have the same body plan and, uh, and uh, habitat that they had back in the Cambrian. So, so we have a better chance of understanding how they build their shells and how to interpret their uh, their apparent tidal cycles that they that they uh, have recorded. This one here is a rudist, which is you know quite remarkable. Uh, it's also a bivalve. This is the one of the valves, and the other valve is over the top. And it also uh, has has uh, uh, increment has gr has grown increments that that uh, follow the tidal cycle, and uh, recently has been analyzed uh, several times over the past uh, five years. Uh, and then brachiopods is the third one. The third one is the most difficult in my view to analyze these. I, I, I still have trouble finding uh, publications that sh can show me the pictures of the, of the growth increments uh, with a pattern in it. Nonetheless, uh, there are several records of the brachiopods that are very promising. And and all of you know all of the, the corals, bivalves, and brachiopods today are are uh, part of the modern communities that uh, work on coastal areas, uh, marine biology, because of the their, the interest in how uh, the invertebrates uh, build their shells in the face of increased ocean acidification. So uh, there's a very active community today, and they're using you know modern tools that the guys back in the 1950s and 1960s didn't have. And so uh, I'm hoping that uh, there will be a new effort to go
go back to the fossil record and build new data sets. So the constraints that we have is that uh, uh, the fossils need to have originally lived in the subtidal zone below the intertidal zone because you don't want them to, to necessarily be uh, uh, exposed to air and stop growing altogether and, and create hiatuses. And so, but you want them in a subtidal zone that has tidal, active tidal currents, but they shouldn't be too active either uh, because that might also uh, prevent, uh, prevent uh, the shells to grow. And so you can see that corals and brachiopods and bivalves all fall within this, re this, uh, this uh, regime. And so, uh, and so it's no surprise that they seem to be, seem to have uh, recorded tidal signatures uh, in, in uh, fossil specimens of all ages. Uh, now, the other uh, problem with the fossil record is that uh, this is the geologic time scale from the Ordovician, 400 million years, 300, 200 to the present. And uh, you can see that the bivalves have been there from the very beginning and they've increased. And then there's these, the rudists, I showed you that solitary uh, clam, uh, uh, bivalve shell that's, that looks like a coral. And, and uh, it came on the scene at the end of the Jurassic, but then by the end of the Cretaceous, it was gone and it, uh, and it did occupy a reef environment. So they built these big reefs of, of, uh, of uh, individual rudists. So, so they no longer are there. We have, as far as I know, we have no modern analogs to the rudists. So uh, it's almost a problem trying to analyze, uh, analyze how they build their shells. But uh, there are people who are, there are scientists who are endeavoring to do just that. But bivalves by and large are the largest and most continuous uh, uh, group that are available. The others are brachiopods, but brachiopods, while they were very common in the Paleozoic, uh, they began to, to uh, diminish and now are rather difficult to find, uh, you know, compared to before. And you could go to any limestone in the Devonian and it would be loaded with uh, brachiopods. So brachiopods do have uh, a lot of potential and uh, as do uh, rugose corals. Rugose corals originated in the uh, uh, Ordovician, maybe before that. And, uh, and they thrived in the Devonian and again, and in the Carboniferous. And uh, then uh, they were uh, victimized and went extinct at the end of the per Permian period. Up here is, uh, the rate of extinction and origination showing that the end of the Permian was a time of great extinctions in the oceans uh, uh, of the world. So those are the, those are the uh, constraints. And so I'll just give you some examples of these, of these different forms. So rugose corals originated in the Ordovician and then they went extinct at the end of the Permian. And solitary forms, uh, this is a diorama showing how they envisioned that solitary forms uh, grew. They, uh, uh, they attached themselves on the substrate and then just grew up. And these are the, uh, the uh, polyps, the living part of it. These are large, these are about 10 centimeters large in, in total. So they were not small guys at all. Uh, so, so what you can see here is that there are these, um, these, uh, these lines indicating the growth lines as, as it, as it grew upward and every once in a while it will change orientation. Presumably, uh, it, um, uh, moved, it was moved during its lifetime. And so it kept on going towards, uh, the sun. Um, this is a, a bigger photograph showing uh, a rugose coral on its side. And uh, this is one of the corals that was analyzed for, uh, 
for tidal, uh, tidal laminations. So if you look here, you can see that there's this from here to here and here to here has been uh, interpreted as representing a, two, a, a year of uh, accumulation. And so one year and two years. And within them are these uh, smaller groups of, uh, of accumulations uh, that are thought to represent months. So actually uh, lunar months. And uh, within them are the individual laminations, which are too small to see in this, in this particular uh, uh, photograph, but uh, helpfully uh, this, this uh, student, he's actually a student, uh, he drew these out so that we could see that there are about 30 of these daily, interpreted as daily cycles that made it, uh, that, that uh, occur within these, these M layers. So they're monthly growth bands and they're two annual cycles and each has about 13 M bands and each M band has about 30 uh, daily laminate in them. So uh, it, was, it, it was not until 1984 and then again in 2007 that uh, I could find you know, a, a, a good description of how, <laughs> how these uh, data were collected by, uh, by uh, paleontologists who, who uh, were working back in the 1960s and 1970s. All right, so bivalves uh, also, uh, they grow, uh, and apparently they grow daily. This is Mercenaria Mercenaria from uh, Maryland, also known as, as it, quahogs. And uh, they, they grow their uh, shells uh, parallel to the uh, shell margins. Now, uh, it's also important that they not live too far below the surface or, uh, and, uh, and, but, but they need to live close enough to the surface so that they, are, uh, they uh, uh, benefit from the tidal cycles that run across them. So this shows that Mercenaria is, is just below the substrate and, and uh, so therefore apparently uh, uh, benefits from tidal currents that move back and forth as it uh, feeds. So this shows a very early uh, SEM picture of the shell of the Mercenaria, Mercenaria. And uh, you can see that there are the laminations here um, and uh, the panela actually went in and uh, got the tidal record for San Juan Harbor close to where this particular specimen was living and was able to, uh, to uh, correlate all of the cycles uh, between the shell and the tidal record. And this has been done a number of times by different, uh, different researchers. And finally, brachiopods. Brachiopods, they're so common in the Paleozoic that certainly we should be able to use these uh, to analyze their, uh, their growth patterns. And so the brachiopods, they appear in the earliest Cambrian. And uh, as I said, very abundant during the Paleozoic. And their descendants survive today in the oceans, but they're not uh, abundant as they used to be. And they're different from bivalves. Bivalves have a, a, a symmetry that's shown here between the valves, but you have to turn the brachiopod sideways to get the, uh, the line of symmetry. And in addition, they are lophophores. And so they, uh, they have these special organs that they use for feeding. And uh, that is not a feature in a bivalve at all. So they actually have their own phylum. But they live uh, also uh, on the substrate. And uh, they've been shown, especially new studies of modern uh, brachiopods have shown that they also, uh, they capture every single tidal cycle. It's just an amazing thing. This is an old picture here. Um, 
well, actually it's not old, it's new, it's a modern one, showing uh, the, uh, the lines of growth along this, this uh, particular specimen. Uh, so in 1963 was the first attempt to, uh, to, to analyze rugose coral growth uh, and put it in a context of geologic time. So actually what this shows is these are not uh, uh, data points here. This is a line, this is a, a model of what a prediction of what uh, the evolution back to the Cambrian should show in terms of days per year, given uh, a change in uh, of two seconds per 100,000 years back through geologic time, which was estimated originally by Monk and McDonald in, in 1960. It's not that different today. <laughs> so uh, he did go and find Devonian rugose corals and was able to estimate uh, uh, days per year between 385 and 410. That would be for this interval here. So uh, maybe a little bit, you know, so it, it's not clear whether or not, you know, that's quite a range. So uh, I'm not sure how useful that is. And then he did the same in the Pennsylvanian. Again, he got a narrower range here uh, of 385 days to 390 days. And that was the first attempt to do this. And it's, you know, he, he describes in general, and, and just very generally how he does, how he was able to count these, but doesn't give very much, um, uh, doesn't give details on exactly how he did this. So uh, it is amazing that uh, uh, this captured the attention of a lot of people. And, uh, and only a few years later, another set of researchers put together a set of, of uh, estimates of days per month from tidal patterns and bivalves uh, from Devonian to the recent. And, and I was uh, somewhat amazed I had not focused on this. I thought this was just the end of the graph, but it's actually a data point that was estimated from a stromatolite from the Konakachi formation, which is a famous uh, limestone here in Maryland and, uh, and Virginia and Pennsylvania. And uh, I know this well, but I had no idea about this. Uh, it was before even my time. So what you see here is that in days per month, uh, days per month starts around 29.5 and increases. And then there's a small decrease again that occurs in the Triassic. It was not uh, uh, honored by this polynomial fit that the authors did. And then uh, it takes off and the days per month increase towards the end of the Cambrian. And already at this point, the authors were uh, wondering whether or not this had anything to do with uh, the shallow seas uh, around the Pacific Ocean causing uh, increased tidal dissipation during this time and maybe limited seas, there's no Atlantic Ocean. Maybe this caused a, a change here and then uh, very limited seas with wide continental shelves with a large Atlantic Ocean uh, increasing tidal dissipation again. So they were, they were already thinking about this back in the 1960s, uh, most certainly with the help of uh, geophysicists such as Monk and McDonald and Harold Jeffries was another player in this as well. Go forward to 2012 and I accidentally amazingly found in the Russia Geology and Geophysics Journal, this uh, contribution. These guys uh, uh, measured 276 fossils of their own, and they have reported them here uh, in this work. And then they uh, also collected ones from previous works, have to go and find out which ones they are. I still haven't done that, and assembled them uh, for the Phanerozoic, they're all uh, corals, bivalves, and brachiopods. 
And here now you can see, I don't, you know, it, 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 it's sort of amazing that they all line up and show a, a decrease in length of day, very dramatic, all the way to the end of the Permian, and then a sudden turnaround for a small time, and then a continuation uh, towards the present down to 365 days per year. And they also thought that this, this changing pattern had something to do with uh, the continent ocean uh, 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 distribution on the earth, where uh, when you have uh, a lot of shallow seas, then you would have more tidal dissipation. But then when you uh, uh, create a supercontinent, you have less uh, shelf area. I don't know why exactly it would go back the other way, uh, but, uh, but then with rifting, uh, again, shallow seas now become uh, very prominent again, and so uh, uh, tidal dissipation would increase again. I put this here. This is a uh, rudist that was analyzed by De Winter at all in 2020, uh, just to see where it fell on this graph. It falls about uh, in line with all of the other evidence. So, uh, so that that is the uh, most recent of these uh, Phanerozoic uh, Earth Moon evolution uh, uh, compilations that there are. Okay, so now to go back before the Phanerozoic, before the time of the Metazoans, we have to turn to tidalites, and then of course we'll go on to uh, cyclostratigraphy, which um, really just sort of swamps the whole field with data. But the, of course, the advantages over fossils was noted by George Williams many years ago. Uh, he pointed out that tidalites extend the Earth-Moon system data into the Precambrian prior to the Metazoans. The periods that are recorded by tidalites, tidalites can also be ascribed to tidal pattern and type, semi-diurnal, semi-diurnal, mixed, and this avoids uncertainty associated, associated with fossils. And in short, uh, it, it's, it appeared that tidalites really were more sensitive in a way uh, that uh, fossils are not. So for example, here, here's, this is a two, this is two centimeters and this is up and this is an aggrading uh, tidalite showing neap cycles, neap, 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 neap. And then a phase flip here in the middle it's not evident from here, but if you read the paper, you can see what he means. Then neap and neap and neap. And in between, these spring cycles uh, are estimated to be either moon at apogee for A or moon at perigee. So apogee was that they're thinner, the bundle was thinner, and for perigee, it's thicker, thinner, thicker, thinner, thicker, thicker, thinner, thicker. So it changes its pattern. Uh, this here is a uh, progradational tidalite and uh, it's very large. Here's a, a man's hand, here's his hat and a, uh, a hammer here. And these are interpreted as uh, dominant cycles and subordinate cycles. So they are, they are accumulating sideways with a very strong current coming over the top, going back and forth. So uh, the other thing is that tidalite sequences can span many years. The longest thus far measured is 60 years long. There's no other tidalite that comes close to this, although we have uh, long identified one in West Virginia, not far from where I am, uh, in, that is, uh, that is uh, 300 million years old and uh, may have as much as 30 to 40 years. We're not sure yet, but anyway, so you can you can uh, analyze potentially longer term periods that, uh, for example, the lunar to uh, the lunar nodal cycle, which are certainly ob not obtainable from fossils. So uh, this is I just wanted to show you some recent tidalites, and this map over here gives us 
uh, a, a way here over here, this is land. And there's this channel that comes out into, this, into the sea, into the ocean, and it's known as an ebb tidal channel. And so there's this maybe a barrier system here and this break in the, in the barrier system, which allows uh, tidal currents to move in and out of this channel. And depending on where you are, if you're close to the main ebb channel, then tidal cycles will collect in a progradational fashion, you know, as, as, uh, as, uh, as uh, the tidal currents uh, come over the top back and forth. So they, they will, everything, it, it's, very, it's actually somewhat challenging to try to measure these things. But, you know, when you have a spring tide, then sandier material will be brought out, or brought in and out, and, uh, and make thicker uh, layers. And then when the currents are, are, uh, are less intense, then this is the neat cycles and they'll be much thinner. So this shows here an example in Norway, up in the Tana River, up in the North. This is an area that now has been uplifted because of uh, glacial, isostatic readjustment. So it used to be under underwater, but now it has has uh, been pushed up above. And you can see these neap tides here separated by uh, these spring tides. And the paleo flow in this case is moving to the right. Uh, so that is known as a prograding tidalite. But if you go offshore, so, so that's because it's very close, it's in very shallow water. But if you go into deeper water, then you have the potential to, uh, to observe aggrading tidalites. And so they just, they just aggrade vertically. So again, this has been moved up into the, uh, uh, you know, above sea level in Norway, but it shows these uh, spring and neap and spring and neat tides, a very short interval, very large, very thick uh, tidal cycles. And of course, during the winters, there's no flow in this particular area. And so there's a clay layer that starts off the winter. So this, is, this would be an aggregational, and it was most likely in uh, the uh, deeper part of a ebb tidal delta setting originally. So we can see these in, uh, in ancient tidalites. So this shows a field trip that the Geological Society of London uh, took down in South Africa to visit the Moody's group. This happened uh, 10 years ago at least. And at this point, all of the tidal cycles have, have been flipped sideways. So you can actually walk across them and look down at them. And you can see here this uh, spring and neap and spring and neap tides and paleo flow is in this direction and up is in this direction to the, to the left. Uh, so that is a prograding uh, tidal cycle, a uh, tidal pattern. Uh, then there's uh, the famous aggrading tidalite from the Elatina sandstone in Southern Australia. And these are the magnificent ones that uh, in total, he's counted 60 years worth of these. So, you know, <laughs> you got to keep counting and there's, until you get 60 times 365, or if there's semi diurnal tides in there, then you get twice that. So it's, it was a huge project for sure. And uh, I don't believe that the raw data are available to this day. So I intend to, to approach. Uh, George Williams to ask if if he would be willing to post them. So we have examples. Uh, and so how do you analyze these uh, these bundles, these patterns? These are, these come in these bundles. So these fortnightly tides. And so two of the fortnightly tides uh, equal one month, uh, and and in full circle uh, for a full orbital cycle of the moon around the earth so uh you can do this by analyzing 
uh, by setting up a model of solar days or lunar days versus Earth moon distance. And so this assumes uh, these, this would be S would be the solar days. This sets up the, the model and then you can, you can solve for solar days and uh, Earth moon distance and map out uh, this, this uh, curve here, which shows you that this is today where the Earth moon distance of today is the same uh, as one. And then as the moon uh, is closer in the past to the Earth, then of course this ratio gets smaller. So the number of days per month uh, maxes out at about 0.825, right around here. This is lunar days. And there's also the potential that some, uh, some tidalites or, or, uh, or fossils respond to solar days. But the, so the lunar orbital period increases as the moon recedes. So the moon is receding in this and toward the right. And so the orbital, lunar orbital period increases. And there are more Earth days per lunar orbital period. But Earth days also depend on the spin rate, which is decreasing through time. And so the increase of lunar orbital period at first exceeds the increasing number of days per period. But then this effect reverses as the Earth's spin rate continues to slow down. So uh, this so this shows the uh, the projection of what uh, the, the uh, days per lunar month should be for different Earth Moon distances, and this blue curve uh, shows what the uh, what the rotation rate should be, assuming conservation of Earth Moon angular momentum. So a busy slide, uh, but uh, this is how th these are the equations that are relevant to these three curves. So I wanted to I tried to plot these up these different tidalites, and uh, one thing to note is the Elatina is here at six forty uh, million years ago, and that plots here, and it has twenty nine point five days. And uh, so it plots here, and then uh, it plots at about uh, 0.9, uh, 0 0.9, the ratio, Earth Moon ratio of 0.9, and uh, has a 21.9 hour day. On the other hand, the Moody's, uh, based on Eulenfeld and Hoybuck, who have submitted the paper where they have data that you can plot up, they uh, found a 30 day uh, a 30 day uh, lunar cycle uh, 30 lunar days per uh, synodical month and this corresponds to a 13 hour day and so that's how you read this particular set of graphs uh, this was uh, worked out by Runcorn in 1979 and uh, and with the help of Jeffries, who uh, estimated the ratio of, of lunar to solar tidal frictional torque to be uh, one over five or one over 3.4, uh, depending on different uh, uh, periods of time. So uh, one other thing to note about I guess we're running a little bit low. I'll, I'll just go very quickly through these. Uh, uh, George Williams proposed that the best of the the tidalite data would have to would have to pass three tests, and the three tests were three tests to to uh, solve for the uh, the uh, present day Earth moon distance to the the earth moon distance at the time of interest. And so one was uh, uh, estimating the lunar, lunar, uh, lunar nodal cycle from the data. This actually is not possible for most uh, tidalites. But if you do, for example, for the Elatina tidalite, which is 60 years long, it has a period of 19.6 
years, as opposed to today, which is 18.6. And this uh, gives A versus A0 of 0.969. You can also uh, use Kepler's third law to test the square of the orbital period of a planet. Uh, and it's, uh, it's proportional to the cube of its mean distance from the sun. And in terms of Earth-Moon system, uh, you can, look, you can uh, take the orbital period of the Earth and sidereal month in the past, and uh, uh, T0 is present orbital period of the Earth and sidereal months. So, uh, for example, the uh, Elatina satellite indicates 14.1 months per year whereas today we have 13.37 months per year, which gives an A over A0 of 0.965, very close. So that's the second test giving a similar uh, result. And finally, the loss of the Earth's rotational angular momentum through tidal friction of the moon and the sun and the change in lunar orbital angular momentum can be expressed through this equation, which has a long history, but uh, the ratio, the present day ratio of orbital, lunar orbital angular momentum to the Earth's rotational angular momentum is 4.93. And so using this equation uh, and inputting the tidalites uh, sidereal days per year versus present day sidereal days uh, gives you and A over A0 of 0.968. So they're all very, very close. And so should, so this particular tidalite, the Elatina tidalite, it's the only one of its kind that was able to, uh, to uh, be tested these three different ways and, and, uh, and show consistency among them. But, and most tidalites will only be able to do test two and test three because they're much shorter. So I wanted to end with the cyclostratigraphy, which changed all of the expectations of, of geophysicists and astronomers everywhere. And this uh, cyclostratigraphy, of course, gives us the opportunity to measure orbital eccentricity, obliquity, and precession index cycles from which you can estimate the Earth precession rate, spin rate, Earth-Moon distance, together with solar system secular frequencies and also contribute to the geologic time scale. Uh, so this is the spectrum of an ETP, standardized curves showing all of the different uh, lines that are associated with the eccentricity, obliquity and climatic precession and their origins in terms of K, the precession rate and the Gs and the Ss. So the 400, 141, 23, 22, 19, and 16, and all the smaller ones as well. One of the tricks is understanding the precession rate of the Earth. And this can be estimated using the solution to the Poisson equation. Uh, the precession rate frequency is a function of the mean motion of the sun. It's inversely related to uh, the Earth's rotation rate. Uh, directly uh, proportional to the Earth's dynamical ellipticity, which is very interesting because ellipticity can be estimated as a uh, in terms of hydrostatic equilibrium, in which case it becomes a function of rotation rate squared. And so this disappeared, and so K becomes directly proportional to uh, to rotation rate. And these are the other components. Uh, related to this, uh, you can read them here, but these are the two major ones. And then the, uh, the, uh, the obliquity of the earth as well. So with earth's tidal dissipation, if you look down from, oh, so I just wanted to point out that the uh, precession is uh, caused by uh, the earth, the moon, sun, and other planets pulling on the equatorial bulge of the earth, which is caused by the rotation rate of the earth. So that is symmetric around the equatorial plane. But now if you look from above the, the North Pole, you can see that the moon uh, itself raises a tide 
mostly in the ocean, but also in the solid earth. And because the earth is rotating very fast, it moves the bulge forward. And, uh, and this then is pulled by the moon, uh, causing, causing a, a, a constant breaking motion to occur. At the same time, the torque that the Earth's tidal bulge exerts on the moon leads to acceleration of the moon's orbital motion and the moon recedes from the Earth. So this was first proposed back in the 1700s by Immanuel Kant um, and uh, has been a subject of, uh, of investigation ever since then by uh, oceanographers and geophysicists. And this is a summary of the Earth's decelerating rotation, which is predicted by this. And these are different models. I'm not going to go through all of them here. Someday I'll maybe put them all together and, and give a description of it. Uh, one, I know that uh, Farad is here. This is, I tried to replicate this over the entire history of the Earth showing that the hours per solar day, in this case, um, uh, is predicted to uh, increase, excuse me, decrease. So Earth rotation is increasing dramatically uh, uh, throughout geologic time. And it undergoes these interesting uh, uh, oscillations, especially during the Phanerozoic. And I, I might say that the, the fossils actually uh, uh, confirm that something like that is happening. Um, I do want to say that, that because the Earth's rotation rate is increasing or is decreasing towards the present, that means that the precession rate is, uh, is decreasing towards the present. So uh, this is uh, Jacques' model. Uh, using present day conditions to extrapolate back into the past. And so for the past 250 million years, this is today, we'll, we have a precession rate of about 50.5. And this means that over time, uh, if you start from today, these are our well-known periods for the obliquity. This is the main obliquity and it, uh, 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 decreases back through geologic time. Uh, the 41 go, it goes down to about 30, uh, 33,000 years is predicted at 250 million years ago. And, and the same is true for all of the uh, precession and obliquity periods that are associated with K plus an S sub I or a G sub I. So does the cyclostratigraphic evidence bear this out? So we decided to, our, my uh, Chinese colleagues and I decided to test this to, to look and see if we could find this increase in K through geologic time. And we used the uh, methodology developed by Myers and uh, Malinverno based on the Myers time opt method that jointly analyzes observed climatic precession modulations which are the, a, a, an expression of the orbital eccentricity and the direct orbital eccentricity that's recorded in, in cyclostratigraphy so often to, uh, to find the sedimentation rate that optimizes K and G uh, by matching the modulations and the eccentricity, uh, modulations from here and the eccentricity from here at the right sedimentation rate. So this shows a synthetic astronomical time series that's been uh, converted to depth with a sedimentation rate of two centimeters per thousand years. Uh, and, uh, and so the idea is to uh, apply different sedimentation rates and then estimate the uh, then, then uh, filter the data across the resulting uh, 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 precession band according to that sedimentation rate and compare it to the frequencies of the orbital eccentricity. So you can see that if it's 
if it's at the wrong sedimentation rate, you'll miss, you'll, the band will miss all of the variability. So there's only one, one sedimentation rate where both the, or, the, both the orbital eccentricity of the modulations and the direct uh, eccentricity will match each other. And that is at two centimeters per thousand years. So you have to test all of these in order to arrive at that conclusion. And for each one that you test, you can uh, estimate a, a fit of the envelope and the spectral power fit between the two, between these two. So, uh, and there's some other tests here that I can't go to uh, go into at the moment, but it, but there are ways by using Markov chain Monte Carlo simulation to explore the data in the model space to try to try to set up estimated uncertainties uh, for this fit. So time up MCMC is now being uh, it right now only uses G sub i's and k's, and uh, there's an effort now ongoing to improve the technique and to expand it to include uh, S sub i optimization. So I guess I really quickly have to go through all of these uh, these different uh, sections that we analyzed. So the first one is from Walvis Ridge that's been analyzed previously by Myers and Marlon Verno. And uh, here's the record that was analyzed. And you can see the 400,000 year cycles. Uh, the analysis uh, indicated a sedimentation rate. So these are prior sedimentation rates that are examined. And th this is where all of the, uh, the sedimentation rate uh, ultimately ended up uh, giving us a best fit uh, uh, precession constant, a precession rate of 51.3 uh, for this interval at 55 million years ago. Uh, this is from the Wu Ping formation that's uh, Permian in age. This picture is actually from below it, but uh, it continues up to this and you can see the, the strong uh, cyclicity also, it's declining. The sedimentation rates are getting lower and lower until you get to the end of the Permian. And uh, so quite a dramatic slowdown in sedimentation rate. But this is from the Shaanxi, China. Uh, and this uh, series here uh, is approximately a thousand, uh, excuse me, a million years long. So these are two 400,000 year cycles. And the time off MCMC results gives us about a three centimeter per thousand year uh, sedimentation rate and a best fit. This is a prior, and this is the uh, end result of the uh, Monte Carlo simulations, uh, giving us a best fit 55.86 arc seconds per year uh, uh, precession constant. This is older now at 55, 455 million years ago, giving us a, uh, a 59.72 arc seconds per year uh, precession rate. And further back again in this cryogenian, I'm sorry, I'm going fast because I'm running out of time. Uh, this is about 800,000 years, uh, 700,000 years long and gives us a 70.21 uh, uh, arc seconds per year uh, precession constant. And finally, oh, well, this is also uh, about 1400 million years ago in the mid Mesoproterozoic, the Shamaling formation that was analyzed by Myers and Malinverno, who analyzed a 85.8 uh, arc seconds per year procession constant. This was their prior here. And finally, the Dales Gorge member, which is just below the Joffrey member that was recently analyzed by uh, Marguerite Lantink at all 2022. And uh, this is a, 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 a core series. This is actually a grayscale scan that picks out the church and the 
uh, and the iron, the, the uh, oscillating shirt and iron cycles going through the series. This series was estimated to be more than a million years long, has a very slow sedimentation rate, and it has, uh, it was estimated to have a precession constant of 105.3 arc seconds per year. So uh, this actually is being uh, analyzed again with, with new data that was obtained from the same core and new, uh, new uh, uranium lead dates, which indicates that this might actually need to be changed. And we don't know how that's going to affect the precession constant. So to summarize all of this, uh, this is Earth-Moon distance that is obtained from those uh, precession uh, rates, constants, and lined up here. So these two are from Myers and Malinverno, the rest are from Zhu et al. He is here today. Thank you for coming. And it shows a, uh, a trajectory back in geologic time that for a while seems seems to uh, to follow the ocean, the so-called ocean model of uh, of uh, uh, proposed years ago by Webb. But from here to here, there is a change uh, indicated by the Dale Scourge member. And I will say that these are our tidalites here that also indicate uh, a change uh, to a, a lower a lower rate of of uh, uh, Earth Moon distance change over this period in the in the uh, early Proterozoic. This can also be uh, uh, at, uh, 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 this could also be uh, what's the word I'm looking for um, evaluated in terms of the mean tidal drag. And so when we do that, of course, they're very spaced far together, but they show that there's this very high value uh, that occurs at the beginning of the Paleozoic, and then it decreases again and increases towards the present, which is what is, uh, has been long uh, assumed to be occurring. But this is a, a new result. We don't know yet. We need more data to see if this is actually real. But it does show that there's a, uh, a uh, large increase during this time. And this is compared to the ocean model and then a smooth change model that has been proposed by uh, Waltham. OK. All right, so I wanted to conclude today to say that uh, I think we should go back and get all the fossil data and encourage more measurements, uh, you know, well-placed. Marine fossils provide estimates for, of days per synodic month and or synodic months per year and days per year. And they may also, uh, in some cases, uh, uh, follow the solar day. And rigorously measured data appear in the literature starting in the 1960s to the present. And this all needs new digesting and compilation to be useful. And many of the reported fossil specimens are housed in museums and they can be retrieved for remeasurement with modern methods if, if uh, we really need to do that. And today there's also a very active marine biology community that's study, studying growth processes for modern corals and bivalves and brachiopods that can be brought to bear on observations from fossil forms. And tidalites provide estimates also for days per synodic month or synodic months per year and days per year. And in the rarest of all cases, the lunar nodal cycle, rigorously measured data appear in the literature starting in the 1980s to the present. And these need also new digesting and compilation. Digesting meaning you have to go back and, and figure out exactly what they did. Uh, and tracking down the original raw sedimentary data may be problematic. None are stored in museums or in secure archives, for example. Not even uh, you know tables with data. We don't know where the original data are. So 
But again, there's an active Tidalite community, to community today studying the dynamics of modern times and Tidalites that can improve the in interpretation and measurement of our ancient Tidalites. And last and certainly not least, the astronomical force stratigraphy archive provides empirical estimates of solar system fundamental secular frequencies, which I did not discuss today, but is uh, has also provided by the two studies by Malin Verno, uh, Myers and Malin Verno and Zo et al. And uh, Earth precession rate, rotation rate, tidal dissipation, uh, dynamical ellipticity, and Earth moon distance for billions of years into the geological past. And since cyclostratigraphy is the most prolific of the three media, it will provide a quasi-continuous reconstruction of Earth-Moon dynamical parameters and solar system frequencies at a very fine scale. Short sections are sufficient to obtain statistically constrained estimates of the G sub i and soon also the S sub i and K in spin rate and Earth-Moon distance. And finally, uh, uh, orbital rotational solutions with adjusta adjustable parameters are needed for modeling tidal dissipation and, and dynamical ellipticity in the in the uh, in the the way that uh, Laskar et al. 1993 uh, provided, and now most recently has been provided again in a different way by ZB and Lawrence. So thank you very much. I'm uh, indebted to many friends and colleagues who've helped me. So many of them are here today. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, right now I'm being supported by Heising Simons Foundation and also by uh, the 111 Project in China. And in the past, I've enjoyed the support also from the Chinese uh, universities. And finally, long time ago from the United States National Science Foundation. Thank you very much. Thank you a lot, Linda, for, for this uh, overview. And uh, thank you also for the accent put on the on the on the coral, on the bivalve. And yeah, the, the bivalves. Bivalve. Okay. Are there any questions in the audience? Uh, yeah, I have a question. Yes, Margaret. Yeah. Hi, uh, thanks. Yeah, uh, 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 thanks very much for the very nice overview indeed, especially about the fossils uh, and tidal light records. Um, I guess I have two questions. So the first is about, you showed uh, a graph where there was a sort of summary of the Phanerozoic fossil growth band data, and then you sh showed that they, they tried to fit a, a line through it and we saw an increase in the length of day during Pangaea rifting. I'm not sure, I mean, maybe this is a question also for the astronomers in the room here. Is this physically possible? Uh, at all. <laughs> uh, uh, is, if uh, Linda is hesitating, maybe I can... Uh... Sure, you go ahead and, and well, put your two cents. Because in. I was I was also puzzled when I saw this uh, this graph that you show, and uh, of course, if we think of uh, if we just think of uh, body tide or uh, ocean tide, there is no way you can do that. Absolutely no way. We are increasing the length of the day right now. And it was, uh, so it was accelerating the Earth instead of decelerating the Earth. One way you can do it if you think that the Earth contract in some way. So that's just conservation of angular momentum, but that's very weird. The other way you could think of is through uh, thermal atmospheric tides. This is what we can do for Venus. For Venus, there is an accelerating torque that is provided by the heating of the atmosphere. But for the Earth, it's very weak. So you, you really, to have something like that, it, you really need very specific condition. And there is a debate at present 
whether such an event, for example, has occurred uh, back in time, but not to not to accelerate the Earth, just to stop the deceleration. Yeah. But accelerating would be so. Even this is contestable. Even stopping the deceleration is contestable, but accelerating will be even more difficult to realize. And so this change in uh, dynamical elasticity. I mean, yeah, you can do this whole interval, that would, For how yeah. long could that have an effect? Because this was like but a change in dynamical elasticity will not change the fact. It will change the rate at which it accelerate, at which it decelerate, but it will not change it from decelerating to accelerating. Yeah, yeah, okay. So maybe you make it more. You you make it a little bit less strong, but still yeah. you are breaking. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah. So then the second question I had is about the uh, deal scorch member. Uh, you discussed at the end. Um, well, we know based on the uranium lead ages of yes. the, yeah, of let, those let, me just, let me just yeah. clarify that when we did this study, uh, your ages were were not available, and you're still under moratorium, so we can't discuss your ages. So that was the problem, and so we uh, we. Uh, elected to use the available geochronology from Trendle et al. 2004. But as soon as you uh, publish the data, then I think that you should actually go back and and rerun the Dales Gorge member yourself with, you know, with a different uh, sedimentation rate range that's consistent with the dates, the new dates. So that, I just want to make sure that, you know, that that's what that yeah. was the decision we had to make at the time, which is kind of <laughs> odd because we got it results. <laughs> yeah, of course, I can comment on that. Is that uh, the Nature Geoscience paper about the Kuruman had been out there, and then the cycles in Kuruman, the Gorge member of the same thickness. So that ah, also okay. give you an idea about sedimentation rate of the Dills Gorge member, right? It's a, an order of magnitude difference, of course. That's true. Yeah, we and my question is so if the, uh, when you run this time opt now on this two meter section of the Dills Gorge member with 100% 100% incorrect sedimentation rate range, you still get a reliable, reasonable estimate of the precession constant. So, what does that tell you about the method, right? So it's a bit scary to me, actually. I, I yeah. agree, and this is something that I hope that you're going to work with um, Steve on this. Okay. <laughs> So I, I can't comment on that because uh, uh, it, it's uh, you know maybe not enough work has been done just on pure purely uh, noise series. Mm -hmm. We we have not run time opt MC MC on uh, red noise series. I don't think I don't think that has been done. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. It says something about, uh, I think, dependency on the priors that you put in, right? So, yeah. Uh, okay, well, right. <laughs> more work to do. Yeah, thanks. That's right. No, I agree. I agree. Uh, I will say that the priors that uh, we used in uh, the Zoo et al. study, let me see. Um, do I still have it? was quite broad. Um, am I show am I here? So the priors, uh, uh, of course, you know, we, we uh, made a preference for anything close to 100, but we did allow, you know, for quite a bit of variability. And it chose this one. So it's possible that uh, that uh, this was in inadequate, and um, so we're hoping that you will rerun this using the new data, using your new uranium lead data. Yeah, yeah. Yes, uh, Eugene. 
Um, uh, and everybody hear me? Yes. yes. Uh, Linda, I, I have two questions about the title lines. Uh, for first, uh, I want to know the the kind the kind of monks the fossils and title lines record. Is that a uh, synodic monks, tropical monks, or sidereal monks? Uh, I would say, so So there's a question. The questions are have not been answered in any case, in, in any case for the fossils, but uh, but depending on, you know, their, their mode of life, uh, they, if they're responding to the tides to, to a large extent, they must be uh, responding to the, to the, the, the so-called lunar day, uh, which is slightly different than the solar day. The lunar day and the lunar day and the lunar synodic months. That should be right. it. That's right. And but there are other, you know, when you look at the Rugos corals, for example, if there's a year, it's not clear whether that's the uh, whether that's the uh, you know tropical year or the uh, lunar year you know it's, it's just not clear what it is so uh it, it, I, I think you have to look at the the life strategy of the fossil to decide you know it, whether or not it it relies on the sun or the tides more and that will be the deciding factor uh, so it depends on the the type of the fossils. I think so, but you know this is a this is a question that has, as far as I can tell, has not been answered. Uh, it cannot be answered for the rugose corals, but it certainly can be answered for different types of uh, uh, bivalves. And the problem is that in the publication, it's very often very obscure. They don't know. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> uh... They don't know. They but, don't but, say precisely what they do. That's that either. They don't. And but the but the modern studies they are are very focused on on uh, measuring environmental conditions at all times. So, for example, uh, I can think of a study even in the 1990s of, of an example where uh, these uh, uh, paleontologists were looking at modern modern bivalves and so they followed them they measured them every day and they <sighs> measured the temperature of the water and the tides that were occurring at that location and uh you know if, and they did that for you know 10 days at a time and you can see for example you know the temperature of the water will go up and down you know on a, on a daily basis responding to the solar day and then you have these uh, semi-diurnal uh, tidal cycles that have semi-diurnal and diurnal uh, components built into them. And even after five or six days, they, they for a little while they disengage and they become uncoupled slightly. And then they presumably they have to come back, <laughs> you know, by the end of the year. But uh, so they 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 are somewhat uncoupled for periods of time. Uh, throughout the year. So I, I'm very interested in understanding more about that. And, you know, uh, these days with massive data collection, I have to believe that there are uh, modern studies that have collected data, you know, you know, hourly or minute by minute for more than a year. And so I would like to see what those studies look like. You know, and in relation to modern bivalves. Oh, I see. Oh, then, uh, if different fossils have, uh, uh, have different response to the, to the tide. What, uh, what about the tidal lights? Oh, the tidal lights. Uh, yeah, they also have, <laughs> they have different responses as well, oh. depending on where they are, and how much sediment supply they have. You know and how strong the tidal currents are, and uh, whether they're aggrading or whether they're prograding. So yeah, I mean, you know, the, maybe the the only reliable uh, aspect of a tidal light in the end may be just being able to identify every single 
uh, every single title cycle that's recorded and hope that every single title cycle is recorded. But, uh, you know, oh. so, you know, sometimes some, some title lights will show, will show all of the details, you know, including, you know, semi diurnal mm -hmm. subordinate dominant cycles, and they'll show, you know, the neap tides and the, and the, uh, and, and the difference between uh, a neap tide and a spring tide that is related to the apogee versus perigee of the moon, you know, because they have different sedimentation rates. So, because yeah. the strength of the tides is just ever so slightly different. And, so, uh, and if I may complete, if I may complement this, it's true that the tide for the tidal it you you have place on the earth where you have two tides per day. You have place on mm -hmm. the earth where you have one tide per day. So mm -hmm. when you have a record, you don't even know whether in the original configuration, you have something that will respond in a two tides per day uh, period or in a one tides per day. And it is true that, uh, as you say, Linda, the modern approach, which is to try to make present simulation of what uh, what occurs in a, in some place, and it is valid for tidal heat or for bivalve uh, growing. It is important to make this simulation to be able then to try to de to say exactly what kind of uh, proxy you are looking for, you you are looking to, and what what is the signature you can expect from the astronomical point of view. So, and my question, Linda, is that all, okay, there are these studies right now, and it is good because it's going the right direction, but do you think there will be some, um, it will provide some definite improvement for the use of bivalve in, uh, in this uh, measurement, in this? Uh... Yeah, actually I do because, you know, the, you know I, I'm looking, I'm thinking about the De Winter study uh, that came out a few years ago on the rudest bivalve. And uh, that was a very, uh, it was a set of studies actually uh, that he did on this rudest. Uh, and, you know, there's been, uh, you know, a, a, there's been a lot of uh, attempt, there have been many attempts or, or, you know, sophisticated attempts to try to understand the, uh, how exactly the the uh, the accretion process occurs, although I suppose in the end for a rudist uh, it's impossible to really know. On the other hand, if you can identify specific uh, fabrics of of uh, of uh, secretion, you know, of of calcite secretion, uh, maybe you can identify those in modern forms of bivalves uh, and, uh, and sort of indirectly link uh, all of them together so that you can uh, argue for you know, the, the speed at which uh, uh, accretion has occurred and how it occurred. So, uh, so that was sort of a roundabout way that makes mm -hmm. me think that that it, it may it may be possible to better than we have today, which is very little to nothing uh, in in uh, linking you know present day processes to what happened to uh, what happened in fossils. Oh, uh, I, I want to know the the day uh, recorded in fossils. Uh, maybe solar day or lunar day. What about the day recorded in tidal lights? Is that lunar day? I would think that would be lunar day. Uh, but would... in fossils, uh, we are not sure. Uh, yeah, it could be either way. I mean, if you have if you have like a, a, a bivalve that spends its time, you know, in the sediment and just poking up, you know, its feeding tube to get nutrients out of the water, then I would think that it would be more uh tuned to the uh to the lunar day uh okay 
But I don't, but we don't know for sure. Uh, but title lights, for yeah. title lights, it's for title lights, I would, I would, I would be more uh, comfortable saying, well, yeah, the, it re it's responding to the tides and the tides are, uh, are a response to the moon. Oh, okay, okay, I see. That's what the, I was saying. The tide is a mixture of the moon and the sun. And the sun, That's yes. The problem, it's a meaning, it's not... meaning. <laughs> It's not and that, only and the that's moon. True, yes. And you can see the annual cycle. You can see the semi-annual and annual cycle uh, that's raised by the sun. You can see that too. So it's, it's <laughs> you can see it in the earth tides, in the, in the ocean tides quite easily. I have a record from Key West that shows it beautifully. So you were right, uh, uh, Jacques, you know, so it's, it's hard to disentangle all of it. Yeah, it's why it's why you need to. It's why it's good to have some uh, some modern experiment to try to. That's right. To see what it does. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Matthias. Uh, hi, Lina. Yeah. First of all, thanks for. Uh reappreciating fossils and tidal lights because sometimes as, as cyclostigraphers we tend to to like our cycles but um just to comment on so i worked with niels de winter on the 2020 paper and, and and just a general comment is that many of these papers from the 50s 60s 70s they're very visual and i think one of the major steps forward now is that we have these new imaging techniques new super high resolution geochemistry which, and I still, the visual approach is still very valuable, but we have these new tools we can put next to this. So I think what you say about revisiting the old samples and that that will be super interesting. A lot, uh, of, them, a lot of them are in museums. So theoretically they're there. Yeah, I agree. So my, I have a question. So clearly from all the discussions, we see there are a lot of uncertainties and, and they might be different for different archives. How do we deal with this? It's I know it's a bit of a general difficult question, but I think it's quite important because we tend to put one number on the graph, but actually we have a range. We have, um, yeah, how do we deal with this? And then there is a bit of discussion. Do we put all the data we have on the compilations and we see what it gives, or do we stick to the best ones? And, and how do we define those? And uh, I would... Yeah, I yeah. would think you'd have to get the best ones, <laughs> and yeah. that 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 also is somewhat subjective, at least for the old work. For the old work, mm. you have to go in and see exactly what they're saying. So you know, I'll start reading it, and my and and uh, you know, my, my eyes glaze over. You know, so <laughs> but you know, with some fortitude, then one can go in and and see exactly exactly what they're saying. And there are some data points that are better than others. Mm. And, uh, you know, we may never be able to, to get the raw data. You know, it, it's interesting. It's possible that those old studies, since they used, they used specimens that are now in museums, it is possible that, that, the, that the specimen is there and underneath it is a paper that has all of the measurements, all the, the measurements on it. I've found... Uh, in the uh, that that was true for uh, for several rocks that I I was looking at in the in the uh, Smithsonian. So so all we have to do is go up to Peabody Museum and look for the rock and see if there's any measurements you know on a piece of paper <laughs> that is provided. That would be ideal. Wait. So Linda, it, uh, thanks for the talk. I, I totally agree also with Matthias that the quality of the records is crucial. And so I think also with the fossils, it's not a matter of just uh, selecting one fossil and doing uh, the analysis. It's maybe selecting 100 fossils and then first look which fossil is actually the best one. Uh, so one of the things that we should not forget, for instance, if you look at the Hayes et al. paper, what Jim Hayes did, he went through thousands of cores or something like thousand and to select the ideal core. So this kind of optimization of the data set before you are going to do the analysis is already very, very important. 
Right. So, so by that measure, then it would, I don't disagree with that at all. And so one would have to be very uh, uh, thoughtful about, you know, what geologic time one might want to do. So for example, uh, you know, Marguerite pointed out that there seems to be this turnaround in the Triassic indicated by the, the Russians. Well, let's go look at that more carefully to see what exactly did they find. And, you know, did, was it a different set of species that they started looking at, you know, after the Permian or, you know, what happened? So, I mean, there could be an, another explanation for that. Uh, but I'm also a bit concerned about if you select, let's say, data sets that are less ideal, that they start to confuse you. Eh? You get this kind of data that are not uh, maybe correct, and then you may run into trouble because they dilute your, your data set your, if you make a compilation. And so I think we have to be very, very careful about, uh, for instance, then the, the fossil that you select to analyze. Right. No, that's right. Uh, fortunately, we have cyclostratigraphy to help. <laughs> <laughs> so I do not agree with Matthias said so the, uh, the shells are also psychostigraphy yeah? so it's <laughs> yeah but but what I mean you see what I mean though but we have an independent data set to to uh to uh make an evaluation or evaluation is not the right word a comparison no. okay any other comment or question Yes. Yeah. Yeah, Linda. <clears throat> uh, very excellent. Uh, okay. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, very excellent uh, uh, presentation today. And uh, uh, I have emailed you that some. Uh, I have some comment on the uh, uh, machinism uh, about the three uh, records, three kinds of records mentioned today the fossil, the tidal lights, and the psychostratigraphy. I think the uh, machinism uh, between uh, these three records are quite different between each other, uh, especially the psychostratigraphy, because it is uh, mainly based on the, uh, our understanding about the uh, precession, uh, precession rate K and the, uh, the Poisson, Poisson, um, Poisson equation you mentioned today. Uh, if we have some uh, uh, error in this, uh, maybe the uh, oh, they have different uh, machinism. So uh, uh, because the precession rate is a very long time, of course, uh, is about uh, uh, twenty uh, about 20, uh, 20 uh, kilo years. And the other records maybe uh, show the uh, time of uh, about uh, uh, the day scale uh, or hour scale. So um, uh, when we transfer from the uh, psychostigraphy uh, record to the, uh, uh, for example, the length of day, we use the, the K to calculate, uh, to calculate the length of day uh, the, which we use a uh, uh, equation to transfer between them. So uh, the, uh, it may cause some uh, system error between these three records. So when we uh, arrange them together to the same graph to compare them together, um, so we may um, be careful and uh, to uh, mention some um, uh, difference between them. So I think it's a very interesting question. And uh, what, what about your idea? Uh, well, about well so this is mm -hmm. reminded me of what the, the three consistency tests that uh, George yeah, Williams- Your three test is very interesting, but I uh, st uh, still can't fully understand them. So uh, I think it's uh, related to uh, my ideas. So. Oh, okay. Um, I will. okay. Mm. Right. So it's all, it's, uh, it was described in the Williams 2000 paper. And mm. he was uh, I, obviously very excited because the Elatina tidalite 
uh, passed all three tests. <laughs> mm. But that's the only Tidalite that has ever passed all three tests. And so, uh, you know, with that, uh, you know, the, the study of Tidalites uh, dropped off very rapidly. And only a few, uh, only a few Tidalite studies have made it into the literature since 2000, maybe, maybe only one, frankly. And uh, so that's sort of a shame. Uh, uh, there have been some review papers that have come out uh, in 2012, 2013, but no new Tidalite data have been uh, have been right. assembled. So, so, so there's a famous Tidalite in West Virginia uh, that's that's uh, Mississippian, Upper Mississippian in age, and. It's called the Pride Shale, and uh, it is, it's likely to be uh, upward, uh, upward of 20 years in length. You know, it's, it's hard for me to say because there's several ledges uh, mm -hmm. on which the entire formation occurs, but that would be, that's another titleite that uh, may pass all three of those consistency tests. But having uh, uh, analogous con consistency tests among all of the different media uh, would also be very useful. You know, such as, such as, uh, can we all agree on, uh, you know, the length of day? And if we don't agree on the length of day that we get from all three, you know, that occur at the same time, then what's wrong? <laughs> yeah. Then you'll have, you know, you have three different media, that, and you can decide, you know, okay. are all three wrong, or are two of them agree? Do two of them agree, and there's an odd mm. one out? It's a useful. It's a useful. Yeah, useful perhaps in, a, you know, in a limited. Okay, and uh, Paul has a question. So I have a basic measuring question. So you, this work, this is a problem. The VARBs, tree rings, tidalites, you name it. You can see an alternation of color and a change of thickness. As you go to extreme of one side, especially darkness, they all merge together. How do you measure in the merged part? <laughs> you can't. <laughs> I know. So how do you get a number? Uh, you, well, your number will it will have an error in it if it's if there's something there that you have yeah, like zero to infinity <laughs> well i mean you know that's if, you, if you're measuring darkness that's a big problem but if you go to micro xrf then maybe you have a, a i change. think that the same exact problem uh Could i don't be. think I mean, it goes away there's also the sedimentation rate problem there's you know you can see it in the apogee perigee <laughs> Uh, I mean, I, I thought about this a little bit. I mean, you know, there, there must be some way of, of approximating the part that's merged together with some uncertainty, right? I mean, it, it's not, it is not infinite. Um, so has anybody done the math for that? I mean, just, it seems very fundamental to me. I look at those Williams uh, little bands, and oh, that's very nice, but there's a part there I can't yeah. see anything. Well, yeah, that's yeah. why I want to get the data. I want to see how he did that. He's so, so I am going to, I've been threatening to contact him now for months and well, years. And so now it's time because I think he's, he's retired now. So, yes, <laughs> so, I, I have a whole, I have set a fair number of, of barbed intervals uh, in, in Triassic Jurassic stuff that show a, bun, a very clear, very, very beautiful, clear bundling, but with the same problem. And so if I want to compare it to, to, to you know, solar cycles, or I want to compare it to anything, I, I, that part where they're, where they're coming together and merging presents a fundamental barrier. You can assume a minimum number of years, but not the maximum. Well, I mean, it's sort of it's sort of cyclostratigraphy in miniature, you know. So, I mean, you you know, we have these precession cycles that are modulated by the eccentricity, and they sort of disappear, you know. You know, when 
they get down but, into it, the... but that's different because that's an amplitude change it's the free the frequency but it's both change. but it's both the frequency i, I know but change. i don't like, I, I tend to shy away from the ones that have the frequency strong frequency modulation. um the, the, the but but it, when there is a strong frequency modulation which is what it looks like with these barbs and with the uh, uh tree rings and with um um the tidal lights I, 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 I mean, maybe I, I, I should walk over to the tree ring lab and ask those guys how they do it. Um, yeah. Well, it's, one it's thing is that, you know, it, it seems clear that that the, the tidalite laminations are, you know, they respond to the tidal current strength, right? And so they not only, so, so the type of sediment that actually makes it in, makes it into the deposit uh, you know, we'll have a different color, you know, maybe it'll be sandier if it's a higher, you know, if it drops out first. And, and then, you know, when there's the clay drapes that come over the top, then time starts to uh, squeeze together, right? It squeezes together. So there is a, a frequency modulation with every cycle. Mm -hmm. So one correct, so, so I've, thought about how 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 are we going to correct for that you know you know with but modern is the, techniques is the real stuff better than the picture because it's true that when you look to george williams uh, picture the photographs everything merged together in the in the dark area but in, what about the real stuff is it uh, does more more precise more high uh, accurate uh, picture give better results or does it, I don't does know. it actually I, merge together? I suspect without knowing that there are uh, there are long intervals where uh, where the where the uh, the laminations may be larger and just easier to count. And so when you look in his paper, you'll see areas where he is he has measured the thickness of, you know, a series of laminations. And then he, you know, he gets the the 14 day, you know, or 13 day cycle and and uh, and uh, and then over long periods of time, he can actually see a modulation of that in, into a 60, uh, excuse, excuse me, into a 19 year nodal cycle. So, you know, he, he but, he, but that's all he shows us. He doesn't show us what the data actually look like. I mean, if, if you have, um, if you have a piece of rock in which the laminations are larger than the grain size, right, hopefully, right, it, a way to, to, to fix the, the ability to measure it is to cut a diagonal through that rock. Yeah, that helps. I've done that. Yeah, I did that in. If you look at the paper in um, that I did way back in eighty, whatever that triple P paper was, not eighty, ninety, ninety six. I actually cut diagonally through the barb section because they became too small to measure in thin section, right. uh, and so uh, and and when I expanded it by cutting diagonally through it, you're just sampling. You're sampling the information at a greater um, at a much greater density uh, by cutting diagonally. Uh, but if the if it wiggles in the lamina or the um, or the grain or, or it starts to approach grain size, well, then the information isn't there. Um, so uh, so I, I was thinking about you know for example, geez, you know the, these different lamination lengths. You know that that is really what uh, Williams relies on for his you know his uh, counting his the number of cycles, you know, the, the number of laminations per cycle. That's what he really relies on. And but but now you know with modern techniques, what we have you know we'll go in and we'll scan something. So we'll have you know you'll be able to see inside each lamination. Sometimes you'll see you know the double peaks and stuff. And so the the, the challenge then becomes okay, how do you tune that? <laughs> Can can you tune it to correct for these variable sedimentation rates that are associated with uh, each of the laminations? And so I think you know one has to go the route the route of you know something like the 
the the uh, time opt or or just uh, or some similar type of technique where where actually one could imagine uh, setting up a series of models for what the tides were and then using a signal correlation to see how well it fits. But that's also a, a sort of you know shoving the data into different models to see which one works best. So it, it, that's that hasn't I haven't been satisfied with that idea either. <laughs> I, mean, I guess you could you could do look at the at the uh, function of the thickness of the laminate versus the width of the entire bundle, and do a projection to the end. Yeah. Yeah, but you don't have many, so that would be a little bit short, maybe for the expo extrapolation. But that, at least, it can be, it can be tested. Right, right. Yeah. Any well, other question? Margaret? Yes, as just a comment. So, I mean, shouldn't we also maybe say that tidal lights and fossil growth band estimates just give you a maximum or minimum estimate? Uh, right, and that we just have to maybe we have to accept there's a certain uncertainty there. Uh, yeah, so you cannot, uh, you will never be knowing how much, how many laminations have not been deposited if you're in, in if you're looking at the record where they are becoming so uh, uh, thin. Yes, you can uh, try to to estimate an uncertainty which may be larger on one side. On one side, that's right. Yeah. 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 Agreed. I agree. But the, the error bar that are given in the publication on the uh, tidalites are already quite large. So if you increase them, you don't get much information. <laughs> that's true. I think you have to do a better job measuring, as Matthias <laughs> will would favor. Okay. Any other question, comment? If not, uh, so thanks again, Linda, and that was a very nice talk and. Uh, Thanks to everybody for being here and having also this lively discussion at the end with what we like here. And, uh, and the, next, the next talk will be um, um, the one who will be presenting it doesn't know it yet, but it will be, <laughs> it will be Mohammed. And uh, <laughs> so we'll speak of the Earth Moon. Uh, directly connected to, to the present talk, it will be on the recent result uh, we had about the Earth's moon evolution and give more detail about the curve that you put on your plot. And by the time, uh, everything will be available in a wide uh, way. So you could plot it with the real data, uh, Linda. Oh, that would be great. <laughs> all right, thank you all very much. Thank you for coming. And so I will see you all. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.